Thank you for tuning in to the Golden State Media Concepts Bible Study Podcast. I am your host, Sarah. And if you have um, found us for the first time, I'm really, really happy that you're here. I'm really, really happy that you found us, and I hope that you will um, enjoy your time with us and join us again. Uh, if you are someone who is a returning listener, I'm grateful for that. I want to say welcome back, and thank you for joining me again. Um, as I mentioned in the first half of this episode, uh, this is a two-part episode, and in this episode we are looking at the lectionary text assigned for this week, the week of July 20, July 31st, 2016, and I was trying to explain, uh, just in case people haven't tuned in before, that the lectionary texts are a group of assigned readings, assigned for each Sunday um, in the year, and they are always divided into readings from the Old Testament, the Psalms, the New Testament, and the Gospels. And so this episode is split into two parts. Uh, the first part, we talked about the Old Testament text. And in the second part, we're talking about the New Testament texts, the readings from Colossians 3 and the Gospel of Luke. And in the first half, we had some rather complicated readings. And I think that this second half, the readings are... Um, a bit complicated as well. And so we're going to explore some more of the themes that we started exploring in the first half of this episode, uh, explore a few maybe slightly different themes, but uh, I think there's a definite thread that runs through all of the texts for this week. And so our discussion is going to um, try to follow those threads, connect those threads as much as possible. And I'm excited to get started with you today, but we do first have to take a quick break. And when we come back from that break, we'll be talking about this week's text from Colossians. So stay tuned and we'll be right back. Want to find out what movies to go see? Then check out the GSMC Movie Podcast. It's your ticket to the latest movies, whether it's a new blockbuster event, romantic, comedy, or action flick. This show has got it all covered. They talk some what to go see now. Don't bother. What's hot on Netflix and everything in between? That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash movie dash podcast. When it's all about the movies, it has to be this new show. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. text for today from Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 through 11. And if you've been listening to this podcast for a while, if you've been hanging out with me for a while, you might remember a few weeks ago when we were still uh, discussing Paul's letter to the Galatians, you might notice that there are some similarities in today's text in this letter to the Colossians as there were in that letter to the Galatians. In both instances, Paul is reminding the churches that he's writing to to avoid what he refers to as earthly, earthly things in favor of those things which are spiritual. 
In the Galatians text, he referred to those as the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, here in the Colossians text, he refers to those as new clothes, new clothes, as putting on new clothing. And here, that list of earthly things includes fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which he says is idolatry. And then he actually has two lists this time, because then uh, just a verse later, he he also lists... In addition to those things that I just mentioned, he then says anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. He says, do not lie to one another. So he gives all of these things which he considers to be earthly things. So in other words, everything that society tries to convince us on a daily basis in both subtle and not so subtle ways are good things or things that might bring us joy and fulfillment. All these things that they say, you know, they aren't so bad. Don't worry about them. Um, Go ahead and enjoy. The theme that was begun then with this week's text from the Old Testament in Ecclesiastes and the Psalm are continued here. And the discussion of the tension between earthly things and the promises of the resurrection continue. So we get this promise uh, or this discussion between earthly things, earthly tensions and the promises of the resurrection. And Paul is writing to the young church at Colossae, telling them how to live after they have become believers now. He's saying, throw away the old stuff. He advises them to put on these new clothes, new clothes of compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. He says it again, advising them to get rid of more old clothes. Again, you know, such as I mentioned before, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language. Then says Paul, Put on the new clothes that fit you as Christians, like love and peace and gratitude. He also says something else that you might, that might sound familiar to you from the time that we spent with Galatians. And that is in that renewal, there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all in all. So at least you can't, you can't say that Paul was inconsistent with his message in his letters, because now we've seen this. Um, a couple of times. he's He seems to be encouraging the church in Colossae to set their sights more on heavenly things than on earthly things. And if you tuned into the first half of this episode, then you know that I've already been up on my soapbox about the dangers that I see in ignoring our earthly life in order to solely focus on the life to come. So I'll spare you that rant. You can go back and listen to it if you so choose. Um, that would at least give you an idea of what I'm talking about. Instead, I want to look once again to commentator Brian J. Walsh, who is the Christian Reformed Campus Minister at the University of Toronto in Toronto, Canada, um, because we've uh, we've we've gone to him before. We've been walking through his commentary on this letter as we've been walking through this letter um, to the church in Colossae. And so um, it's good to see what his continued thoughts are in this section of Paul's letter. And he writes that in Colossians 2, verses 8 through 15, Paul counters the idolatry and dualism that threaten the church by insisting that Christian identity is a matter of being incorporated into the story of Jesus. Just as we are buried with him, with Jesus, in baptism, so also are we raised with him through faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. And now he continues to unpack the narrative as the foundation for what it means to live our lives in Christ. When Paul writes, So if you have been raised with Christ, seek things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, he is, of course, taking the next step in the narrative from resurrection to ascension. We set our minds on what is above, not because of some heaven-earth dualism wherein heaven is a higher good than earth, but because the risen one is the ascended one whose rule is now from heaven. So Paul continues his theme of being rooted in Christ, of making our relationship with God our solid foundation. That's what we covered last week on the, on the chapter um, chapter 2 of this letter. When he talks about giving up those things that he lists as earthly, it is a matter of remembering our foundation and our rootedness. And then we are to put on those new clothes, the clothes of Christ. We are to go through this world doing the work of Christ and being the hands of God. 
the world is still going to be there. And the world is always going to provide us with temptations. The world will always try to lead us away from the promises that God has given to us. But the world itself isn't a bad thing. Uh, the world itself, though, can lead us to believe that all kinds of things are more important than our relationship with God. So backtracking just a little, um, Pastor Walsh is talking about moving in the narrative from resurrection to ascension. And so we set our minds on heavenly things, not because earthly things are bad, but because now Christ has ascended. Christ is seated at the right hand of God, and now Christ is ruling from heaven. And so we are to look to Christ. We are, look to he- we are to look to heavenly things because Christ is our is our guide. Christ is our, is where we are rooted in the gospel and the promises. So that's what he's meaning by heavenly things. Not that, you know, to put it just in like really plain, simple terms, earth, bad, heaven, good, but that there is this tension and that, and the reason that we look to heaven, of course, is because that Christ has ascended and the next, next step is from resurrection to ascension. So then that leads to putting on the clothes of Christ, putting on this new lifestyle of Christ that helps us to address the earthly things, the things that can um, lead to difficulties in our relationships, you know, anger and an abusive language, etc. So we're to put on these new clothes and we are to go through this world doing the work of Christ, being the hands of God. And as I said, the world itself isn't a bad thing, but it can lead us to believe that there are many things in the world that are more important than our relationship with God. It's easy to just try to go with the, with the flow of what the, the common society is telling us, and those things can turn our attention from our relationship with God. For instance, um, sex in itself is not a bad thing. It's on that list. You know, sometimes when Paul's talking about earthly things, he mentions sex and sexuality. It's in itself not a bad thing, but it's one of those things that can become so important to us that it then becomes more important than our relationship with God. Another example, money in itself is not a bad thing. It, money can actually be used in ways that are good and can affect change in the world. But again, if money becomes too important to us, so important to us that it supersedes our relationship with God, then it becomes an idol. And, you know, even Paul was writing in this, this section of the letter that greed is idolatry. Money itself isn't the bad thing, but when we turn to greediness, when we, when we make money so important that it's the only thing we think of, then that's when it becomes something that we need to worry about. So an idol or a false god is anything that takes the place of God in our life. And that is that can be anything from, like I said, sex to money, to our career, to alcohol, you know, all those things that we can consider things that we can become obsessive about. Um, you know, I always joke because I love chocolate that even chocolate can be that. I mean, you know, if I decide chocolate is more important than my relationship with God, I'm not trying to be flip because, you know, those things can happen, but you name it, it can become an idol when it becomes more important to us than our relationship with God. And we're going to talk more about this when we come back from the break, but we do have to now take a quick break. So please stay tuned and we will be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play.
Welcome back to the Golden State Media Concepts Bible Study Podcast. Before the break, I was talking about the things that can become idols in our life, the things that can become false gods in our life, and that is anything, anything in the world that um, suddenly becomes so important that it replaces in importance our relationship with God. We don't give up on the world. Um, You know, we're talking about that dualism of earthly things versus spiritual or heavenly things doesn't mean we give up on the world because it contains these things that can disrupt our relationship with God. Rather, we stay rooted in Christ. We stay rooted in the promises that God has given us through Christ. We build our foundation on those promises of God, and then we put on those new clothes of Christ that Paul describes. We put on the things that Christ has taught us, and then we go out into the world with those things. Those things like kindness and goodness, honesty and compassion and love. And we do the work to which we have been called. We do God's work in the world. Pastor Carl Jacobson puts it this way. He writes, We who have heard the gospel are now clothed with a new self, clothed with what may appear at times and to some to be a life like the emperor's new clothes. Um, We will struggle with anger, slander, abusive language, and at times give ourselves over to impurity, evil desires, and the idolatry of greed. But we are in fact clothed in Christ Jesus, raised with him, renewed in him, clothed in the majesty of not an emperor, but the king of kings. And I love how he puts this because now we're clothed in a new self. He's saying we're still going to struggle with all of those things, with anger and abusive language and greed, etc., because those things are in the world and we are imperfect beings in that world. But we have been given this, we are, in, we are clothed in Christ. We are clothed in the promises of Christ. And that gives us a new way of being in the world. Now, anyone who knows me knows that I love shoes. We're talking about being clothed and um, it made me think of my love of shoes. I, I do try not to let them become idols in my life because after all, they are just shoes, but I do love them. I love looking at them. I love trying them on. Even when I'm not buying shoes, I still like to try them on. I love to just wander through the shoe aisle. Um, same with books. I can wander through shoe aisles and book aisles to my heart's content. It's my way of relaxing. Um, I love looking at shoes on other people. I love to people watch because I love to shoe watch. Um, I love that there's such a wide variety of the sho- of shoes in the world, ranging from adorable to crazy to practical. You know, there's a shoe for every kind of activity you could want, um, ranging from sexy to just plain weird. Uh, so... I personally am not very tall, so when I wear heels, I like that I can actually look my hubby in the eye, or at least get closer to that. I like that I can see things that I can't always see um, over when I am wearing flat shoes, because I am, in fact, short. I like finding that perfect pair of shoes to go with an outfit. Um, When I was a pastor in a parish, um, my congregation used to pay attention to and comment on my shoes every Sunday. It was something of a running joke. I always used to joke that I should be able to deduct my shoes from my taxes because, you know, they were such a part of my ministry because my my congregation liked to comment on them. But for me, I mean, shoes are just something that that I enjoy. They can make me feel more confident, more attractive. Um, They can even be a conversation starter. I tend to be shy in situations where I don't know people, um, but I've, I've had more conversations with strangers about my shoes. So in some ways they help give me an entree into those conversations. So I'm just saying this because I'm I'm trying to to tell you um, about my, my love of shoes because it makes me think of what, Paul is saying about putting on the new clothes of Christ, because putting on shoes affects the way I feel sometimes. It doesn't change who I am necessarily. Um, And really anything that we wear can help affect how we feel. My hubby always says, if you look good, you feel good. And if you feel good, you can accomplish almost anything. And like I said, the clothes or the shoes don't necessarily change us. But putting on the clothes of Christ does change us because they aren't physical clothes. Like I said, the clothes or the shoes, the physical clothes can affect how we feel. They can affect our confidence level. But putting on these new clothes of Christ actually changes how we interact in the world. These new clothes are the ideologies and the promises of Christ. They're the attributes and characteristics of Christ. 
they give us the confidence, the power, and the ability to go out into the world and to be Christ in that world. And of course, you know, as, as Professor Jacobson said, we're, or Pastor Jacobson said, we're still going to struggle. We're still going to, you know, struggle with those things that Paul referred to as earthly. But when we are clothed in Christ, when we're clothed in God's promises, we are given a whole new way of being in the world. And at this point, I'm actually going to move on to the gospel reading from Luke because it does mirror a lot of what all of the texts from this week have been saying. And so it will further this discussion that we've been having. And so this week's gospel text is from the gospel of Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But Jesus said to him, friend, who set me to be a judge or arbiter, arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, What should I do, for I have no place to store my crops? And then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God." And again, this is the Gospel of Luke. That was chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. And if you did, again, tune into the first half of this episode, you can compare the Ecclesiastes text with the Gospel text from Luke because there are definitely similar themes. You can see a lot of things that are similar in these texts, but they come to vastly different conclusions. So this Gospel starts as many encounters with Jesus start. Someone in the crowd asks him a question. In this case, it's a question about inheritance. And as is so often the case, Jesus refuses to be drawn into an argument that can go nowhere. Um, Jesus is really good at getting out of these, these, these trick questions that people sometimes ask him. He says, friend, who set me to be judge or arbitra arbiter over you? And then he says, take care. Be on guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And again, as is often the case with Jesus, when someone asks him a question, he uh, often follows it with a question or he tells a parable. And in today's text, he tells the parable of the rich farmer or the rich fool. He says uh, the man's crop is so abundant that he doesn't have enough storage. He doesn't have enough place to put all this amazing abundant crop that he has. So he decides to tear down the barns that he has and build bigger ones in order to hold all of it. And God chastises the man for his greed and tells him that he's actually going to die that very night. So all this stuff that he has accumulated is worthless. Jesus points out that this man can't take it with him. Um, like the author of Ecclesiastes, this man's toil would be going to others who did not toil for it. And yet where the author of Ecclesiastes, the teacher in Ecclesiastes, concludes that all is vanity, all is vapor, which can be blown away by a stiff wind, Jesus' conclusion is different. Jesus' conclusion is that this man's toil should have been meant for the community in the first place. He should not have needed or wanted to build bigger barns because he would not have wanted to keep, he should not have wanted to keep the excess for himself. Um, a harvest so unexpectedly large is a miracle. Something about the reign of God is at work here. God is abundantly providing for the entire community. And this is a reminder, I think, to, to all of us that the reign of God is at work in our world on a daily basis. We might not always see it, but it's there. And each of us has a part within that kingdom of God here on earth. Here's where I think we see all of these connections with everything that we've been talking about for this week, from Ecclesiastes to the Psalm to the letter to Colossians, because the reign of God is at work here on earth. And that reign of God works through us. Our work is doing God's work, creating God's kingdom in the midst. Last week, um, if you if you tuned in for that discussion on the Gospel of Luke, 
Jesus taught the disciples to pray and he taught them to pray your kingdom come, meaning God's kingdom fulfilled here and now on earth now. And that's what this is talking about. The reign of God is at work here and now because it's at work in each and every one of us. And we're going to talk more about this gospel in just a few moments. We do have to take a quick break, so stay tuned and we will be right back. Are you looking for help for your fantasy football team? Check out the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. Get today's best advice on who to start, who to sit, even who you should draft. From sleeper picks to red-hot lineups, they got it all covered for you. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash fantasy-football-podcast. We'll cover traditional leagues, dynasty, PPR, even IDP leagues. When you need fantasy help, there's just one show to hit up. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow Follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back to the Golden State Leader Concepts Episode Podcast. Before the break, we were talking about this parable that Jesus tells in the Gospel of Luke. The parable about the rich farmer or the rich fool who has a harvest so unexpectedly large that he doesn't have enough place to enough room to store it, and so he chooses to tear down the barns that he has to build bigger barns. It never occurs to him that he might share this abundance with others, that he might be called by God to do something more with what he has received here on earth. In fact, what he says is, and I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God says to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. I actually have always really liked the way the man talks to himself. Um, it, this does give us a, a, an insight into this man's thought process, but I do love the, how he talks to himself because my dad always says, so I said to myself, self? And apparently my dad got that from, you know, it's biblical, except that, you know, I said to my soul, soul? It just, it makes me laugh because it makes me think of my dad, but it's not hard really to put ourselves into this man's shoes and to understand where he's coming from, because most of us have probably had variations on this conversation. Obviously, it's probably not the exact conversation, but we're surrounded by influences, voices, we're, we're surrounded by advice on how to save for the future for all the needs that will come up. And these are important things to do. These are important part of each of our lives as we decide how to best plan for our future. You know, those are things that we have to pay attention to and, and make sense of for ourselves. But this isn't a pass. This isn't a passage about never saving. It's not that, but rather it's a passage about looking beyond oneself at the needs of the greater community. Where are, where is the greater community in this man's conversation with his soul? You know, he's saying, hey, soul, we're doing good. We can just, we've got stuff for the future. We are more than ready to face whatever comes. So let's just eat, drink, relax, and not worry about anything. And Jesus has many parables like this, many pieces of advice on just this topic throughout the gospel of Luke, because Luke's gospel has a definite affinity with the poor. If you look throughout this gospel, you'll see constant references back to those in the community who don't have as much. And there are hard lessons that Jesus is always talking about for those who have a lot, but choose not to share it with others. The Gospel of Luke is the one that gives us the story of the rich man and Lazarus, the story of the rich young man who Jesus tells to give away all of his possessions. It has the story of um, the camel passing through the eye of the needle being an easier task than a rich man getting into heaven. So Luke is very much like many of the Old Testament prophets because he is constantly pointing the people back to those in need. In the Old Testament, the the, the prophets are always reminding the people that there are others in their community who have needs, the widows, the orphans, the stranger, etc. And Luke's gospel is very similar. 
So Jesus is trying to get people to pay more attention to those around them in their community who don't have as much. And these past weeks, there have been other examples because there's been a lot of talk about hospitality in this gospel from Luke as we've traveled through the gospel of Luke. We've looked through the lens of hospitality, how we should treat our neighbor, who our neighbor is, and there are constant reminders that loving God also means loving our neighbor. And so we have to ask ourselves as we go through these texts, well, just how are we to go about loving our neighbor? Now, the Ecclesiastes author comes to the conclusion that we're all going to die anyway. Life is vanity. Life is vapor. So why bother? But Jesus' Jesus' conclusion, as I said, is different. Jesus is trying to get his audience to be present in their life today and to be rich toward God, to ensure that everyone in their community has enough. And I did say that I wasn't going to get up on my soapbox, but I'm going to go back to my, my slight rant for just a moment because I have heard people refer to the Bible as an acronym, B-I-B-L-E, Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. And yeah, okay, I can see that. It does fit a little bit more with the Ecclesiastics text because it puts the focus on the future with not much thought to the here and now and how we might be helping our neighbor. Um, Puts a little more focus on maybe what we read in the psalm where we wonder, really, what's the point of life here on earth if we are just looking forward to the promises of the resurrection? Um, I appreciate, I, I like more, it's not the best acronym, but instead, B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions about living on earth. <laughs> like I said, it doesn't work quite as well, but it just shifts the focus just a little bit. It shifts the focus and puts it more on the here and now. It looks at how God's kingdom might be present at and at work in our daily lives. It reminds us that we are to be a part of God's reign here on earth, that we have work to do that's just as important as the promises that we have been given about the eternal life in God. We aren't being told never to look to that future, but I think it's important to pay attention to the moment in which we live. It's important to pay attention to the community around us. And the gospel here is a good example of how we never know which day might be our last. We can plan and plan and plan, but we don't always know when that last day will be. And so you can definitely see how there are a lot of similarities between what we talked about with the text in Ecclesiastes and this text with the gospel of Luke. Jesus' parable tells us that planning is important, but so is living in the present and caring for our neighbor. And Jesus ends with that, with that sentence that about being rich toward God. And we have to ask ourselves, what does it mean to be rich toward God? We then look to these other texts and the themes that have been about hospitality, about service, about love of God and neighbor. And that gives us a good insight into what it means to be rich toward God as we look to the verses and the chapters leading up to where we are now in the Gospel of Luke, we get a good idea. We remember the story of the Good Samaritan, how we should sh- we should love the Lord our God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and strength, and love our neighbors as ourselves. We are rich toward God when we show God's love to our neighbors. Being rich toward God might just mean loving our neighbor as ourself, something the man in the story seems to have failed to do when he hoarded all of his excess and amazing harvest for himself. Jesus' parables give us things to think about in terms of our life on earth. He always tells relatable stories that deal with our lives here in the here and now, stories that talk about daily life. So they give us things to think about in terms of our life here on earth, a life which involves community, which involves our brothers and sisters, a life wherein we can show our love of God through caring for and loving our neighbors, caring for and loving those brothers and sisters. So the challenge I think that we get from all of these texts this week, myself included, is to ponder what being rich toward God means in our own lives. And our own lives, meaning both individually and our lives as a community. Do we take the route of the Ecclesiastes author and conclude that all life is vanity and since we're all going to die anyway, nothing matters? Or do we follow Jesus' example, loving our neighbors to the best of our ability in order to live our lives on earth as a means of showing our love of God and all the gifts that God has bestowed on us? We have to ask, how are we going to respond to the miracle of an abundant harvest? And 
I think all of these texts have done a wonderful job of really making me at least, and hopefully you, stop and think a little bit more about just what it means to be rich in God, but also to live here on earth, knowing that the promises of God are eternal. So being present in that tension that we live here and now, but knowing that we have that promise of eternity with God. So it's a lot. It's been a lot of complicated texts this week. I hope that you've been able to stick with me. I really appreciate that you have, uh, that you join me and let me ramble on to you about my thoughts on the Bible. And that's actually all the time that we do have for this week. So I do hope that you will join me again on Saturday when we cover the Old Testament texts from next week's lectionary cycle, the week of August 7th. 7th. And those texts are from Genesis chapter 15 and Psalm 33. As always, I'm going to give you my spiel about our podcasts. You can find all of them, all of the Golden State Media Concepts podcasts at www.gsmc podcast.com and again lots of topics lots of great hosts um, I I think you'd be able to find something else that would be of interest to you you can also download those podcasts on iTunes Google Play SoundCloud any app on your mobile device that does podcasts you can find us there and you can also find us on social media you can follow us on Facebook 